Today we're going to be talking about the low pass gate. And more specifically, we're going to be talking about why people often refer to it as sounding organic or natural. And to do that, we're going to investigate also how to read and interpret a spectrogram or color map of our audio, uh, which can be a very useful tool for analysis, both in modular synthesis uh, and in the real world. First, we're going to look at how a low pass gate functions at its most basic level. Next, we're going to look at how to interpret a spectrogram. And then finally, we're going to call up examples from the real world as well as our low pass gates and illustrate what it is about them that makes them sound so organic and so natural. Some of the more common low pass gates in Eurorack include the Make Noise Optimix and the LXD. Another common one is the Dopefer A101 2 because Dopefer has a module for everything. And there are a few others, such as the Borg by Wired or Maleco, uh, depending on where you are in time. If you were to go back to the Buchla systems that a lot of these are known for, and you look at the Model 292, you can see there's a set of switches at the bottom that allow you to switch between low-pass filter mode, uh, gate mode, so it acts as a VCA, and combo mode, and that's where you combine both the filter and the VCA into one. In most modern modules such as the Optimix and the LXD, uh, you don't have that option. They're just sort of always in low pass gate or both or combo mode. For this demonstration, I have the DPO sawtooth output from oscillator A going into the disting, which I have set up in mode D5, uh, which is a low pass filter. And that low pass filter output is going into our VCA, the mod to mix. We also have the maths here just to provide the positive voltage to control the cutoff frequency on the disting. So, as I said before, a low pass gate is a combination of a filter and a VCA, so they work at the same time. So to illustrate that, let's look at what the VCA can do for us. It's a voltage controlled amplifier, or more appropriately, a voltage controlled attenuator because at full open, all the signal comes through, and we can use it to attenuate the signal down to nothing. And when you raise and lower this volume, all of the frequencies are affected at once. Now let's look at what happens when we turn this up and we go back to our low pass filter. I have it set up for no resonance, so when I turn this down, eventually the signal goes away to nothing because eventually you lower the cutoff frequency below the fundamental, which means no audio will pass through. So this is another way of turning the signal on and off effectively. You can attenuate it down to nothing using just a low pass filter. And compare that to what it sounds like with using the VCA. VCA fades out as you would expect. You can hear the frequencies being attenuated by the filter. No surprises there. Now what we're going to do is plug the signal into the Optimix and take that out. So this is our low pass gate. This means that as we raise and lower the control, we're both attenuating high frequencies and the overall level at the same time. With Optimix it's nice because you can get a little bit of filtering before the overall level starts to dip too much, so you can kind of use it to smooth off some of the rough edges of, of some audio. And that's the basics of what a low pass gate does. And you might ask yourself, well, why can't I just take a inverted envelope and apply that to both the VCA and the filter? And you can, and you use up two modules and it's fine. But there's something special about the low pass gates as far as the response. And that's where the strike inputs on the Optimix and other things come into play. Now we've changed up are set up slightly. We still have the sawtooth output from uh, VCO A, uh, and we're going directly into the Optimix. And we don't have a control voltage going in. All we have is the clock signal from our uh, woggle bug going into the strike input. And what the strike input does is it hits the uh, Optimix with a very short exponential envelope. You can call it like it's pinging it, but we want to be careful with the terminology because pinging a filter is something different. But let's hear what happens when I turn up this this clock signal. Okay, you get this short percussive uh, impact. There's a damp control which you can use to shorten that up. 
at a certain point just becomes some clicks. But that ringing, that sort of percussive element, is sort of unique to the Vactral that controls this. And we're not going to go into Vactrals too much from an electrical standpoint. That's probably for a different video. The important thing is you hear that sound. That sort of percussive sound that you wouldn't get necessarily if you use just a filter or just a VCA. And now we're going to go look at why exactly that is using the spectrograms. I made up this quick demonstration so we can illustrate how a spectrogram helps us to identify things in both frequency, time, and amplitude. So what I have down here is a chart that we're going to populate. Along the bottom is time, and along the vertical axis here we have frequency. Across the top, this is considered to be a separate plot, you can see uh, three signals. And what we're going to pretend is that we have three signals that occur over this time base, right? So let's, uh, let's move in a little bit up here on those. So we have a sine wave, a triangle wave, and then a higher frequency triangle wave. Uh, the sine wave we're going to say, just for the sake of argument, uh, is a standard A440. So this is uh, concert A, 440 hertz. We have a triangle wave at the same frequency. And then we have one octave up from that, or a triangle wave at 880 hertz, right? So these signals, we're going to pretend play over a set period of time. In fact, we're going to say they play over this period of time. So we have a time base here of seconds that goes uh, from 1 to about 8. And obviously this isn't a one-for-one -one demonstration because I tried to draw... 440 cycles within one second, and I guess my pencil tip isn't fine enough. But suffice it to say there is a couple seconds, about three seconds of a sine wave at 440 hertz. There's a couple seconds of a triangle wave at 440 hertz. And there's a couple seconds of a triangle wave at 880 hertz, or one octave up. Now with this top plot, we've got what you would kind of see on an oscilloscope if you were to look at this wave. And this is amplitude over time. What we want to do is convey frequency as well. So if we were to take another plot, like this one, we could see frequency against amplitude. So this is a frequency plot. This is the spectrum of a plot. It would be acquired by taking the Fourier transform of a time signal or in a computer, the fast Fourier transform, um, we would have our sine wave signal going in, our periodic signal, and we would see the individual constituent frequencies that make up that signal uh, through a certain subset of time. Now, in theory, a perfect sine wave is going to be one tone with no harmonics after it. In reality, uh, both digitally and especially in the analog world, it's very difficult to make an incredibly pure sine wave. So we don't go for one that's perfect, uh, and has no overtones or harmonics, but has them minimized. So what I've drawn are the first couple odd harmonics, but you can see their amplitude's pretty far down from the fundamental. And if we were to take uh, a look at the spectrum of a signal coming through like this, we would see something roughly like this. Again, this is just a demonstration. But here we have frequency against amplitude, but nothing about time. If we were to look at the demonstration of a triangle wave, Make sure we get our axis labels in there. You would see a triangle wave is primarily made up of the fundamental and every odd harmonic. So in this case, they will descend in amplitude, but they're going to be much more pronounced than they were on the sine wave. So in this case, we've got our A440. So I've drawn in the peaks roughly at 440 hertz. This is roughly a logarithmic scale. Uh, this should not be on a linear scale when you're presenting things for frequency. It just sort of muddies things up. Um, but compare that to the same wave at twice the frequency. So instead of our fundamental being down here at 440 hertz, it's at 880, and then the odd harmonics above there, and then I got tired of drawing lines. But again, we have frequency, amplitude. What we want is frequency, amplitude, and time on the same plot. So let's go back to the original piece of paper. So imagine, if you will, our scenario where we have a sine wave, a triangle wave, and a higher pitched triangle wave in time. 
as we go across this way. We know what the frequency response or the frequency content of this imperfect sine wave, this analog sine wave, which under some conditions could sound a lot like a triangle wave, but again, demonstration. What we want to do is take each subset of time, each section of time, which we're going to use one square on our graph paper here. So we're going to say we're going to take the frequency response of this sine wave and then the triangle wave and the other triangle wave once every quarter of a second. So every quarter of a second, we're basically going to do a Fourier transform and see what we get. So we have the amplitude over time. We have the frequency spectra for each of these time series, but only for a short period of time. So what we want to do is take this data and translate it to this time series. So what we're going to do is take this effectively 2D representation and flip it on its side because that's all the spectrogram, that's all our uh, color map is going to do is it's going to take this data, basically stand it up on its edge so that these frequencies line up with these frequencies and you can think of it every quarter of a second, every grid square here, so we go one second, two seconds, three seconds, every grid we're going to take this information and plot it across and we're going to do that and signal amplitude with either colors, in the case of a color map on a computer, or with graph paper I'm going to use shading, so the darker the color the higher the amplitude. So you can see we'll find the bin or with the resolution of our graph paper that most closely matches this 440 hertz peak. And this is going to be the highest, so it's also going to be the darkest. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to find the squares that correspond to each of these uh, peaks in our spectra and I'm going to shade them in in the first column. Okay, so here's the first part of our spectrogram. Each quarter second, this information gets translated from this 2D plot, again, to one slice of our time over frequency over amplitude plot. Amplitude in this case is indicated by the shading. Each frequency gets put into the bin that makes the most sense for it. Again, just a demonstration. We have a very coarse resolution frequency-wise and time-wise. But you can see that the fundamental is the darkest, and each harmonic is a lot lighter. So I tried to just barely shade in first couple harmonics after the fundamental. And now this basically is going to repeat until that sine wave is done. So we're going to go right up to uh, three and a quarter seconds. So what I'm going to do now is just shade in the rest of these up to three and a quarter seconds because this signal is constant over time, so the frequency content will be the same over time. Viola. So there we have all of the harmonics filled in. This could be a little bit darker maybe, but demonstration. All of the harmonics filled in over time. So you can imagine this plot sort of moving along vertically. When you see a color map, every vertical section is just a transposed one of these. So now, again, with uh, darkness indicating amplitude, if we go back to our triangle wave, right? so the spectra look a little different, the triangle wave has more pronounced, and this is our double octave one, doesn't really matter, our triangle wave has more pronounced harmonics, every odd harmonic, and so now what we're going to do is show that in time, our sine wave signal stops briefly, and we're going to pick up and illustrate what the triangle wave does. Okay, so there's our triangle wave. So the fundamental is about just as dark, but you can see the harmonics are darker than they were on the sine wave, because the triangle wave, the whole point of it is to have odd harmonics present, which shifts it away from a, uh, a sine wave and towards a triangle. So next all we're going to do is translate the same thing for the one octave up signal. So here, our frequencies won't line up um, with the previous ones. The frequencies are going to be shifted higher, which in this case will mean vertically. So now I'll draw those lines. Okay, so there's our one octave higher triangle wave. So starting at 880 hertz, we go up and up and up and up. Um, again, the frequency resolution here isn't great because I'm using graph paper. And you might be saying to yourself, self, this is a very tedious exercise in order to demonstrate this. Surely there must be a better way to make these plots. And there is. That's why we have computers. But what I really wanted to convey was 
We're taking this information, we're doing it many, 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 many times, and stacking the results. And instead of plotting this information in a 2D manner, we're simply translating the amplitudes into color or shades. So here we are in Isotope RX3. Uh, this is an older version because updates are expensive. Um, so what I've done is I've loaded in a whole bunch of samples that I downloaded from freesounds.org that include audio recordings of natural objects that are struck and excited, similar to what we would do with a low-pass gate. So the first one I have here uh, is a cymbal. So let's listen to that. So we know how to read our spectrogram. We know that frequency increases along this axis. Amplitude increases with color intensity, and time, of course, is along the x-axis. So the important takeaway here is look at how the high frequency attenuates over time, right? At the beginning, you have the initial burst of energy. In fact, you see raw, or you see noise all the way up to the top, so you have that impact event. And those high frequencies attenuate much faster than these low tones, which tend to ring out for a very long time. So if we were to hear this initial burst of noise for the whole time, a cymbal would basically sound like a long static, a long burst of static. But instead what we get is we get this roll off of everything as, as they attenuate over time. So one more time, watch the cursor as it goes. And that's what happens when you strike a cymbal. This next one is uh, someone knocking on a door. A similar thing, you have a burst of the impact event, so you have broadband noise, and the high frequencies attenuate over time. You can see this uh, exponential type slope as the low frequency content carries through, but the high frequency content is attenuated uh, much faster. And that's what it sounds like when you hit something. It's a very natural sounding. Uh, this is a short sample. This is a wood block or a frog block, whatever that sounds like. It sounds like halfway between a cowbell and a wood block. But you can see, again, initial burst of noise, high frequencies being attenuated, you know, up in this range and this range before you see the low tone that carries throughout the length of the, the sound. Here's another example. So here you have a bell. You can see the very clear tones from the bell, but you can see again, there's that exponential slope. The low tones, the fundamental, will go very, very, very long, but the harmonics, the overtones, are damped quite early. So now let's look at the example of the low pass gate from what I was doing in the intro. So what I was doing was varying the time between impacts, and let's listen to that. But look at this right here. This shows us the same sort of, uh, you have that initial impact and then you have that, uh, the high frequencies are attenuated much faster than the fundamental. So if we just look at this section right here, we get almost something not unlike that wood block sound, except we have some more tonal content. And that's why the low pass gate tends to sound organic. You get a filtering effect, which attenuates the high frequencies sooner, and you also get the amplitude effect of something dying down. So when you see something like a wood block or a cymbal or a door knocking, these are events all have something in common. There's sort of like this initial uh, impact event and then the ringing over time as the structure vibrates. So that's why low pass gates sound great. That's why they have this sort of unique tone to them. They're useful as VCAs, they're useful as creative effects, but fundamentally what you're able to do is recreate this sort of uh, naturally sounding decay that comes from attenuating both frequency and amplitude over time. <laughs>